This is Ethan and I'm here with Dave and together we are Dave and Ethan's 2000 inch Weird Al podcast episode 145 inch. On this episode we interview Roseanne McElvain who was Weird Al's longtime makeup and hair designer starting on the film UHF and through the Poodle Hat album. It's Dave and Ethan's 2000 inch Weird Al podcast. It's a podcast about Weird Al. It's Dave and Ethan's 2000 inch Weird Al podcast. Seriously, the whole podcast is about Weird Al. Weird Al you don't have to listen, but we're glad you are. Well, hey, Dave, welcome to this week's episode. Uh, thanks, I, I guess. I guess? Well, what's wrong, old buddy? Well, I, I, I'm just so annoyed and disappointed and, well... Upset. Have you been crying? Yes, I've been crying. What's the matter? I, I, I'm really sorry to hear you're so upset. Well, you know how they announced the Oscar nominees this week? Yeah. Well, weird, the Al Yankovic story was not nominated. This means the odds of it winning Best Picture this year are super slim. I mean, it can't win if it's not nominated. I know, that too. Did you check all the categories? Like... What about best cinematography? Yeesh, whatever that even means. No, and I do not even know who this Oscar guy is, but he is definitely an idiot. Just because Weird the Al Yankovic story isn't even out yet, and I mean, I don't know if they've even started filming it yet, it doesn't mean it shouldn't be nominated for every category. I 100% agree with that. Well, maybe this will actually cheer me up, because now it is time for This Week in Weird Al Related News. A red variant of the 12-inch Beat on the Brat vinyl record store day release is now available for purchase at DementedPunkMerch.com. This release features Weird Al with a studio version covering Beat on the Brat by the Ramones, as well as two Ramones covers recorded during the ridiculously self-indulgent ill-advised vanity tour, Beat on the Brat and I Wanna Be Sedated. This red edition is limited to 400 and is identical except for the color of the vinyl record. Hey Dave, don't you kind of feel like we're being beaten over the head with this beat on the brat stuff? <laughs> Ouch! Well, it has come to our attention that a new song that Weird Al is part of will premiere on this week's Dr. Demento show, February 12th. Keep your ears open, we can't wait to talk all about it next week. And now let's move on to this week in Grammy Award winning Jim Kimo West related news. The Grammy Award winning Jim Kimo West has released a brand new single with Joss Jaffe called Kawaii Daydream. The song is described as a meditative world fusion mix of slack key and African harp. Kawaii Daydream is available where you get your digital music. And now it is time for this week in vegan burrito restaurant related news. This week's episode is brought to you in part by Vegan Burrito Restaurant Burrito Burrito in Toronto, New York, home of the two-pound double wrapped in a quesadilla burrito burrito and Wizard Burger in Albany, New York. Come on down to Burrito Burrito and Burrito Burrito, your Burrito Burrito, or hop on over to Wizard Burger for mouth-watering loaded, dare I say, beefy vegan burgers. From Troy to Albany to your anus, Burrito Burrito and Wizard Burger feed the hungry with out-of-this-world, plant-based, real food, always vegan style. Visit burritosquared.com and wizardburger.com to order ahead. All right, let's get right into the interview. Dave and I are thrilled to have with us today, she was the makeup and hair designer for Weird Al. We're so excited to welcome Roseanne McElvain. How's it going, Roseanne? I'm doing great. Happy to be here talking to you. Yeah, it's so nice to finally get to talk to you. Wow, you have you have quite an impressive resume with Weird Al. I mean, for over 20 years, your first project, I believe, was the UHF film. And then you went all the way through at least the Bob video, the Bob music video. So that is quite a, quite a span to be with, with Weird Al, designing and doing hair and makeup. That's incredible. Oh, it was fun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now, I know we're going to cover quite a bit with your work with Al, but I'm curious about when did you get into hair and makeup? What was your career like before you met Al? Oh my, I started doing talent shows, being the daughter of a Marine, a career Marine, and working, uh, living on Marine Corps bases. And we moved quite often because of the nature of his job. Right. 
my father. And so I would always put together talent shows for every uh, base that we would move to. And yeah, I had a collection of costumes and stuff that my mom had helped collect and make for me. And I would just go through the neighborhood getting people to be in the talent show. <laughs> and I was, you know, kind of running it behind, behind the scenes doing the talent show. I didn't really participate as a, uh, a talent. And so that's really where it began for me. Wow. Yeah. And then in high school, I went through, um, I had two, two loves and two passions. One was aviation and the other was doing, uh, hair and that. And I went to cosmetology as part of a vocational education program at the high school that I was attending in Berkeley, Michigan. And, uh, so I went through cosmetology. And it was years later that I came back to using those skills. Um, my first career path led me into aviation, and I worked in the uh, private sector of it. Um, wow. With Beechcraft. Yeah, I was with Beechcraft for years, um, and it was fun. I loved the company, and I worked for them at uh, in Denver when it used to be at Stapleton. And we were the number one FBO in the nation. And then I got transferred to San Francisco and eventually made my way down to Los Angeles. So I worked for wow. them for years. Yeah. Um, and it was great fun. I, I loved working in the private sector. I mean, we had like A list clients uh, flying in their jets and uh, servicing the you know, their fuel needs and their their customer service needs. And and they just, I evolved from that. And it was like in 1985, I just wanted to, I looked at my life and was like, where do I want to be in the next five years? And I knew I wanted to be in the film industry. Hmm. And even though I, I flew for several people in the industry, um, they knew me as a, you know, as working in flight services, not as a makeup artist. So I really had to make my way on my own. I didn't go to people and ask them to help open doors for me in that regard. So I started in 1985, and then I got on the film uh, with UHF. It was one of my earlier films. Yep. Uh, the first. Yeah, the first film that I ever worked on on set um, was Purple Rain. Wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, so I got my feet wet on that and learned a lot. And that was <laughs> a hard film to, to work through. And and then I got on, I got asked to work on UHF and I was like, you know, ready to go. <laughs> You're kind of like a glorified carnage. <laughs> Now, do you remember how you ended up, you know, getting asked to do UHF? How did that come about? Well, I knew I knew the department head. I knew Lynn Egan, and she had helped me uh, come into the business a bit um, back in those days. And so, I worked on a couple other films, day checking, and people got to see my work. And then I got asked to work on UHF and prior to UHF I had worked on some really low budget uh, B movies mm -hmm. with a bunch of playmates um, with Andy Sedaris and uh, Andy was quite the character <laughs> and so <laughs> I'm sure um, yeah I mean they have even in film school they teach about Andy Sedaris and uh, method to filmmaking, but basically it was, you know, filming a movie in Hawaii and, and on location and having a vacation. Um, so that, and then I, you know, because I had gotten my feet a little bit wet, I was asked to join Lynn on doing UHF. 
What was your role in the film UHF? I was basically I was the assistant makeup in here. What does that entitle in in a film like UHF? Helping to maintain the continuity in the film was the department head. Uh, she was assigned to doing Al and Victoria, and I did everybody else. Wow! You know. Keeping all the characters, I was working with Michael Richards and John uh, is Paragon. I'm trying to remember his last name. Right, right. John Paragon. Yes. Yeah. So uh, and Billy Barty, and <laughs> we had a slew of characters, and then the duo. They were a performance act that came on. One of the uh, gentlemen was the husband, and I believe still is, the Bette Midler. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> His name escapes my head, but we had to do prosthetics uh, on them, and we applied the prosthetics early in the day because we thought that, they, you know, we were scheduled to have them shoot earlier in the day, and then uh, things changed, as it often does in production. And they released them for, like, eight hours. And they're wearing prosthetic pieces. We <laughs> <laughs> can talk back just because of the cost of having, you know, duplicates made through the uh, prosthetic house that was working with us. Yeah. And, yeah. So <laughs> that was, a, that was a, a learning curve for me. And for Lynn. And because when they, they they came back, we were trying to do touch ups and mend some of the deterioration that had taken place for having had them on for you know like ten hours. Right. <laughs> before we got to them, sure. and, and latex will start breaking down, and it was, and it happened right during filming. I, I think I turned white as a ghost. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I was like, oh my god, no, but. You know, we worked through it, and we got it done. But yeah, that was a learning curve. The director and Alice manager, Jay Levy, dressed as Gandhi. Did you put his bald cap on or, or work on him at all? I helped Lynn uh, with aspects of doing the Gandhi character. Yeah. But most, <laughs> of, most of it was done by Lynn. Um, but I was her extra set of hands yeah. to help on that. And again... It worked all day, and I, it was, you know, a learning experience for everybody that you can't put somebody in prosthetic and expect it to hold up throughout the day, and it, it inevitably always happens um, that they get their beauty shot at the end of the day instead of versus the beginning of the day when it's fresh. Yeah. So, and that happens with beauty makeup. It happens all the time. Yeah. So yeah, it was. Uh, it was, a, and and Jay was, you know, also the director. So he was in character, I and mean, he also had to direct. So right. he, you know, <laughs> two hats. Right. Now there are so many iconic, you know, little scenes in UHF. Uh, were you there for the filming of? pretty much the whole film or were there just certain things that you were there for? Do you remember, ex you know, what scenes you were there for? Oh, I was there for the whole film. Wow. Oh, the whole wow. thing. Okay, great. Yeah. Like, how about something like, uh, like Co the Conan, the librarian, um, film, uh, little short or something like spatula city. You, you were on scene for those as well. I'm trying to think the Conan, the barbarian that I wasn't a part of on that okay. section. And if I'm not mistaken, I think Matthew, either Doug White or whoever's doing prosthetics came in to do that. And that was, uh, they did that at a video after the completion. Right. For something like where, you know, Anthony Geary is, turns into the, you know, that alien at the end, are you involved in any of those kind of um, transformations? Yeah. I was working with Anthony during that whole, uh, during all of his sequence in the film and all his scenes. Wow. How fun. <laughs> it was great fun. 
we've had other people on the show who who worked on UHF and it everything that we heard is was that the the crew really got along well and had fun you know behind the scenes and when not filming uh do you recall that kind of atmosphere oh yeah we we were just on vacation yeah um, <laughs> and in case to play we were it was we would go a group of us would go every weekend that we had and we would go to grand lake and we would rent a pontoon boat and for all of us to hang out on and, you know, <laughs> party the weekend. And we would rent a, a ski boat and, and then we would uh, rent jet skis. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, wow. we were just out there for having fun. <laughs> that sounds amazing. <laughs> there was one episode where we... Uh, we lost the van key that we all drove out in. Oh, no. Somehow... <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yeah, the van key got lost in the lake. Jeez. And our oh. first thing, we had to call John Woodward and to have him come get a duplicate for the key for the van so that we could get back. Otherwise, we weren't going to make it to show up for shooting the next day. So, <laughs> kind of put a damper on some things. Oh, man. <laughs> but we had so much fun. I mean, our DP, David Lewis, he came out. He was out there with us. Um, and, you know, we were water skiing and jet skiing and just having fun and letting loose. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, Gray Fredrickson, who was the executive producer on the show, he, in the first weekend in... Tulsa, when everybody came out, because they brought us out a few days before uh, principal photography started to take place. And Gray, uh, in his youth, was like a, a water ski champion. And he was known for his water skiing abilities. So he invited uh, everybody out um, to come out and celebrate with boats and skiing. Um, and so it was a great way. It was just a great crew. It really was. That's so cool to hear. Yeah. yeah. It's, a, you know, it's such, it's such an enjoyable film to watch. And it's, you know, it's certainly one that Dave and I and our listeners have watched countless times. And it's just like knowing that everyone was just having fun and it was a good experience just makes it that much cooler. It was cool. Um, you know, there was only one aspect of the film that wasn't so cool. And, I forget his name. Oh, gosh. His name is Trinidad. Oh, yeah. Right. Trinidad Silva. Yes. Silva. And he went home for a weekend. It was a holiday weekend. And he went home to go be with his family. And if I'm not mistaken, he was killed by a drunk driver. Mm -hmm. So horrible. So that was, that was, yeah, it was. You know, it affected all of us. I can imagine. Yeah. Sure. That was the only thing. And the film was dedicated to him. Yeah. So, but other than that, the, it was great. I mean, we, we had wild animals. We had a baby cub lion. We had <laughs> python snakes. <laughs> For me, I loved it because I love reptiles and I love, you know, wild cats. It was awesome. <laughs> that sounds amazing. After working on UHF, the film, you then, I guess probably the next year, worked on the UHF music video? Yeah, it wasn't a year in between. It pretty much happened shortly after uh, principal photography wrapped on the film. Oh, really? And, uh, yeah, and Al, you know, that's how he operates. He editing as he's working it's it's amazing how he can multitask and function and the first uh video i think that he did was the beverly hills really okay okay yes yeah that was all animation well there were some live sequences in there where they're up on stage were you at all involved in, in that video i can remember that okay i'm gonna say yes but when you say they were up on stage 
who was on stage? Well, it was it was a um, they were cutting to Alan the, and his entire band performing basically the song Be- uh, Beverly Hillbillies uh, Money for Nothing, a, a parody of the Dire Straits music video. Yeah, I did do that. So all of the the live action part of the videos, I was very much involved with. Yeah, um, and did that, and then we did the ZZ Top and the Beatles. Um, I did them, I the one where, and we used the same crew, because Al is loyal to his, his crew and everything. As long as you're performing and delivering, the, you know, the product for him, yeah. he, he speaks to you. But uh, when I did, we had so many characters to go through in uh, shooting the ZZ Top and, right. and the... Uh, the Beatles, and then we went into doing the George Michael. And I had right. an amazing crew that I brought on with me to do the work that was needed doing all that because I, it was too much for one person. And I brought on uh, someone I'd known, and I'm extremely close with her today, uh, Yvonne Dipati. Uh, and she's now Yvonne Dipati Kupka because she married Doc, the, the doctor from Tower of Tower. So, oh, okay. Yeah, Yvonne's incredibly talented, and she's worked with me on several videos through the years. And but we were, you know, and she's like a wig master, and so with Yvonne's help and the help of another hairdresser who's no longer with us, Lindell. Um, and then I was doing hand-laying beard on Al and getting the transformation done. And we designed the wigs. It took four different pieces of wigs pieced together to do the George Michael. Oh, really? Yeah, we did that transformation in less than an hour with all hands on deck. Oh, wow. And when he came out, I mean, everybody thought that he was that it was George Michael. <laughs> yeah, and it was pretty cool because the entire crew, especially the camera crew, um, they gave us a standing ovation, and that that just doesn't happen. And it happened, and it was a pretty cool feeling because we we were just like, you know putting everything that we had into getting the turnaround done in a timely manner. You've got to learn, you know, working with Al, you've got to work fast because everything moves very fast. I mean, there's just so many different iconic characters in that video. I mean, you mentioned a few of them. You know, there's the the Guns N' Roses, George Michael, Robert Palmer, you know, Billy Idol, Prince, Easy Top. There's just so many different characters that Al plays in that, that video what kind of time do you have, you know, to prepare for something of you know that magnitude? I mean, you know, you have so many different so many different characters. You have to make Al and his band look up like. What kind of time frame were you given, you know, to create things like wigs and any other th- any other uh, pieces that you may have needed? Not long, and you know, I would have to build everything um, in advance as much as possible, especially with the wigs. Um, and then when we did the Peter Gabriel um, video, I got a personal uh, thank you from Peter Gabriel. Oh, wow. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, he was really happy with the outcome. And it doesn't always happen that way because, you know, when we did um, the uh, bedrock off of the Red Hot Chili Peppers, I mean, we were shooting in 112 degrees in Joshua Tree. And latex just doesn't like the heat. So mm-hmm. <laughs> a lot of things are falling apart. And stuff. I mean, it still came together fine. Um, but it wasn't, you know, my favorite. Um, <laughs> but you're yeah. dealing with the elements in the desert. And, it, you know, it's, a, it's unforgiving. And then um, I'm trying to think who, who are the other ones that we did. I mean, there were so many that we did. Um, and now, you know, he always asks 
for permission. He doesn't have to have it, but he always, right. you know, gets a right. blessing from the artist. And so it's just, yeah, it's been great fun. All right, well, let's go back to UHF for a minute, the, the music video. I'm curious, you know, that, like we mentioned, there's so many different looks that Al has. And for some of them, I noticed that, you know, he decides to keep the mustache when he's performing a character. And other times he removes the mustache, like George Michael, he didn't have a mustache, he just had stubble and things like that. Was there any decision behind which characters that Al portrayed would have a mustache and which ones didn't? And were you involved at all in, in any of, of that? I wasn't really involved per se in the decision of whether he had the mustache or not, but he would want to keep it as true to form to character. Um, and when like at, with the uh, George Michael and anything that had to be shot following that, then he w- he, he wore a, a mustache that I would apply to him. Okay, so he he didn't cover up the mustache. He shaved and then would have to put a fake mustache on? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> his character is so defined by his mustache, or it was back then, and that, yeah, when we had to shave it off, that was a big deal. And, so, you know, some of the characters, he, you know, it worked with him having the mustache. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> now, were you involved in makeup and hairstyling of all the other, you know, background characters that were in in the music videos as well, or were you primarily focused on Al? I pretty much was married to Al as, you know, keeping him maintained throughout, because at some point in the, the process, Al became the director. Um, I know he was the he's director on the Bedrock video and a lot of them. He just he transitioned and took over directing. And he Al when he's directing, he's editing and you know and often performing. Right. So it's a lot of maintenance to maintain the look. But I did have. Uh, people that would come in. Another one was Kathleen Hagen, who came in on a lot of my um, uh, Weird Al projects. And she and a few other people that were with me um, would take care. But it was all, you know, at the direction of what the look was. So it's basically, you know, designing the look after watching the video and dissecting it frontwards and backwards, so to speak, that um, everybody knows what what's expected. And I bring an artist that are as good as me, if not better, so that I know that the execution is going to go the way we want. Right. And I don't have to worry about that. I'm, I'm not someone that micromanages. You know, if, I, if I've got people working on the team... And they're, you know, artisans. I give the respect, like, here, do this. And you don't have to end up at the end result by going A, B, C, D. Some people have different ways of achieving the end result. And as long as they come up with the end result, that's all that matters to me. I mean, one of the reasons I was asking is uh, we have uh, had on the podcast uh, one of the um, women who was in the Robert Palmer sketch um, that was in the UHF music video who was wearing the fake mustache. Her name was Susan McNabb. But I was just wondering if you had applied her makeup or if you could remember if you had done hers or not. Um, I had myself and I believe Yvonne was doing that with me and... We put some mustaches on. That was something that Al wanted. <laughs> and then, uh, you know, and then, like, on the cheerleaders, in, on the other video, I think it was Nirvana. It smells like Nirvana. Right. I'm the one that wanted to put the long underarm hair. <laughs> <laughs> that their arms. Amazing. It was the thing that I had the creative freedom to do that, but... That just, to me, that was an obvious. It's like, no, you need to have really long underarm hair. But, right. yeah. 
And the paparazzi was always, you know, that was what Al wanted. He wanted wanted the girls uh, done up that way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Amazing. I guess following UHF and, you know, all the videos surrounding that, would the next one be Smells Like Nirvana? We did that early on, and that was that was a crazy long video. Um, yeah. You know, Al talking with the marbles in his mouth. <laughs> and, right. Uh, there was just one gag that we tried to do that just didn't come off right. And that was, like, doing the legs of one of the audience members that was supposed to be like elephant item. Um, it was just impossible to meet the, to do all of the required uh, effect. But, you know, we did the best that we could. And, mm. and I did the wig and everything for Al and that. <laughs> yeah. At the end of the music video, the Smells Like Nirvana music video, Weird Al takes a pair of scissors and he cuts up that wig. Is that, uh, are you okay with seeing, you know, your wig being destroyed like that? Oh, it's a stunt wig. It's a cheap wig. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I love it, stunt wig. That's amazing. <laughs> I mean, they are. They just didn't have the budget for me to go and get a human hair wig and... So all of them are very synthetic, and as long as there's no fire happening on set, you know, <laughs> it, could, it could go up in flames, and plus I have so much product in it to keep it shaped. Um, yeah, I know. It's, um, <laughs> if and honestly, because it's in production, and I go out and I buy the wigs, and it is customary for many hair wig people that you go out and you keep you keep the wigs that go into your inventory afterwards. But hmm. I don't watch them with Al. I would give him some of the stunt wigs because then he'd sell them at uh, Alcom. Yeah. And, you know, they're basically, yeah. they're pretty, you know, they've paid for them. So it's their property. And I just, I was the keeper of that property. And if they ever needed it, then... You know, they'd let me know. Wow, amazing. And so would you also prepare the wigs for when Al would go on tour? I did, and I prepared the beard. Okay. <laughs> and that, oh, nice. <laughs> and I had to do it because they could be used multiple, multiple times. And um, I don't know how long they lasted, but they lasted for quite a while. Wow, sure, yeah. And then when I did the... Um, the Axl Rose, Guns N' Roses video, um, it became tattoo intensive. And I was really fortunate enough to get the contact from a friend of mine who was doing costume designs for a lot of the big rock bands. She actually worked with us with um, doing stuff for Weird Al at the beginning. Uh, Terry King, she's a costume designer and a clothing designer. And she works with Big Rock and Roll Act. But I was able to get the name of Axel Rose's uh, actual tattoo artist, Rocky. Wow. And he lived, oh, in, wow. he lived in Orange County. So I arranged for him. Because his rate and, and that out was, you know, they weren't going to, they didn't have the budget to afford his full rate to come in. And I just said, look, I just need you to come in, lay down the the tattoos and the transfers, and and then you leave. I can take it from there. And so he, you know, he did, and he came in to do that. You know, I had I had to beg, borrow, and steal to make a lot of things happen. <laughs> and I don't, I you know. I, it was my job to run the department, and I would have to run it by the producer and get the approval so that we can do that. But before that happened, it's like I had to negotiate and work magic to to get things to come together. And, you know, 
they don't go through that. It's just like, here, we're going to make this happen. Right. <laughs> yeah. They don't know the real <laughs> impact of having to get that. <laughs> yeah, I just, you know, it's, and I didn't know. I A lot of the, the things that we were jur- doing, it was a learning curve for me. You know, I was just like, okay, I'm going to copy this. And how am I going to do this? And I would run it through in my head over and over and over so that I knew the motions of what I was doing. I knew the timing. I would, you know, I would just play it through in my head because I didn't have the luxury of testing it with doing the actual look. I had to do it all through my process in my head and work out all the kinks so that the day of the video, I knew exactly what I was doing. And that's just how I operate. Yeah. Like, you know, it helps to develop sure, your yeah. dexterity and everything that you need. Um, but yeah. And then there was a funny thing that happened on L. Um, it wasn't meant to be, but it happened. <laughs> I did the uh, tattoos on L for bedrock. Red Hot Chili Peppers, and Al wanted all Flintstone characters. So <laughs> I did all the characters. I did, you know, did, I did transfers that I made so I could put it on and and then fill it in. And then I used a deodorant to cover it to give it a base and to protect the skin. And then I put the transfers on, but sitting out in the sun all day long, he got reverse negative. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh-huh. He goes, honey. <laughs> like, why? He goes, I have suffered. <laughs> and I'm going to have to laugh at That's so funny. And, <laughs> yeah. I mean, in the early years of working with Al, when... Like, when I worked with him on UHF, he might not want this told or not. But, and this is before he met Suzanne and, you know, was in a serious relationship. And it was, the term I used was just a term of endearment. Um, because there's a scene in the movie and he's feeding dog food to, I forget the character's name. His real name was Bob. But he's yes. like Al's yeah. movie. So he's feeding dog food to him. And I go, I started calling Al Alpo. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I called Alpo. And I did that for years. I called him Alpo. That was his, you know, <laughs> nickname for him. <laughs> That's so funny. Amazing. So it was, yeah, it was just about keeping everything light yeah and 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 real <laughs> so and that's just my quirky personality like when we were doing the uh pentium then we had all the girls with the minister car and all that <laughs> yeah do you know what i'm talking about yeah we are the pentium so we were working in a I forgot what the city was. It was somewhere on the east side of LA. It could have been Laverne or somewhere. And it was a government office for like electrical or the uh, gas company, whatever it was that we were working in. I don't remember exactly, but I took pictures of all the girls on a Polaroid and I snuck it in the desk drawer. <laughs> pictures of his family and everything and you could tell he was really somebody just like oh let's leave him a present <laughs> <laughs> and yeah we, I did that that's so funny <laughs> it was so funny, funny yeah huh? it's like it had to be funny it's like these people didn't even know we were leaving their offices. <laughs> <laughs> I bet that guy still has them. <laughs> so, I, you know, I left them Polaroids. I left them little souvenirs. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. So I know we're jumping around a little bit. 
to go back to uh, Smells Like Nirvana, I just have uh, another question about, again, n- not to keep bringing up Al's mustache, but Al's mustache, you know, in, in Smells Like Nirvana is dyed um, blonde. Do you know the decision behind dyeing his mustache instead of shaving it off for that video? I'm trying to even remember that now. Oh, my God, you're taking, you're testing my memory. <laughs> <laughs> Well, because Nirvana had blonde hair, is probably, I'm going to assume, if it's blonde in the video, which I can't even tell you if it is or not. I don't remember that. Um, that that video, I took on a lot. I mean, a whole, yeah. a lot of people in that video. Um, and Jay was still directing. Right. So if Al wanted the mustache to match the hair of the map, that would have been a directive from Al um, that, you know, we remove it and, and put on a blonde mustache. Hmm. I, I mean, that's it. Removing the mustache and doing it and with it and without happened a few times throughout the years. Yeah. So, yeah. I just, like, the one thing I remember about their Nirvana, it was him with the marble coming out of his mouth. Because <laughs> <laughs> you couldn't understand. I, I thought that was brilliant. That is brilliant. <laughs> you know, he is. He's an, an insanely creative man. Yeah. And everything is so thought out. And he doesn't really have a lot to say. He doesn't, he's not a jibber jabber. Um, and I really respect his faith of, of when he's in the chair and there is a process that you go through in the transformation of a character. Yeah. Yeah. If something mm-hmm. wasn't right, he, he would, he, he's comfortable to tell you and in a very direct way. Um, and I was lucky that for the most part, it was spot on. Yeah. Um, the way that it was supposed to look. Um, he always wants it to look like the character, but to also have that very, very fine line of comedic a- aspect to it, like we, we mm. did with the prodigy. Right. How we, you know, that, that was a challenge. But I had a, another makeup artist working with me on that, and, and it turned out great, so... And I didn't know who they were. The Prodigy, that's the lousy haircut video for the Weird Al show. What? Is it? I guess so, yeah. Yeah. yeah it would be if it's the person I know that works with me. And that we did that during, you're right. Okay, we'll have some more questions about the Weird Al show in, in a little bit. Let's go back to the, the 90s and the follow-up video to Smells Like Nirvana was You Don't Love Me Anymore. Do you uh, remember... Any specifics about working on that video? Was it Robert Goulet? Yeah, Ro- yeah, uh, Robert Goulet was in the music video, and uh, and it was it was sort of, it was kind of looked like it was held on the same set that maybe the Smells Like Nirvana video was shot on. Hmm, I'm not really sure about that. I mean, Al was at the um, there's a couple like the one with Robert Goulet. It just went so fast, um, and Al's in a long straight-haired wig. Right, that's the video, yes. Yeah. So that, that, you know, he's just, and that didn't take that long to film because we he, we were on a timeline with uh, Mr. Goulet, who is absolutely a dream. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, Goulet, uh, this is what asked me to work with him on another thing that he did in, in L.A., um, after that, so yeah, that. But in doing that video, it Al was in uh, the long hair, and this is the thing that happened. Like when we did Al and wig, and then he'd get feedback from his fans about, "Oh, your hair looks great, long, straight. Oh, your hair <laughs> looks great, short." Uh, he literally would have himself convinced. Um, like when Al, and I'm sorry to, to stray off course, but 
uh, when Al directed Hanson's video, River, I was with him on that. And uh, and then he plays the, I think it's the Bill Pullman character. And he's got short hair, and it's straight. And he's like, well, do you think I should cut my hair? And I'm like, are you crazy? It's like, no. <laughs> <laughs> You're okay. You know, and we had already tried to perm his hair to straighten it, and we did it twice. His hair will not straighten. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I was like, oh, honey, just, you, you can't go through this again. You know, the chemical process is going to fry your hair, and you're just not meant to have straight hair. And you're definitely not meant to have short, straight hair. I said, that's what we're doing for. <laughs> See, I was just like, no, 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 you can't listen to your fans. Yeah, you look great. And he liked the look of how he looked in a short, straight-haired wig. It's like, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that that uh, particular video where Al had the short hair, and there were a couple other pictures that surfaced around that time as well. And he did a couple of um, little spoofs for uh, an unplugged MTV bit where he was yeah. also in a short wig like that. <laughs> I remember thinking how different he looked with short hair. Right. I mean, I, and I worked with him on all the unplugged oh, uh, cool. MTV. Cool. But, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's one that he did about Eminem. I just still think it's brilliant. But, um, <laughs> Yeah, you know, it, it it pissed Eminem off, but that's just too bad. He needs to get a hit. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you because know, he went off on the defense on that one. Yeah, and it's like, oops, it's okay. Al is not. Al doesn't come from a mean place in his heart at all. He's not capable of that. Yeah, right. He's just really truthful, um, and he's just a very Mm-hmm. So, yeah. I know this is jumping around again, but I would love to hear about working on Amish Paradise and working on the Bad Hair Day cover shoot. And I also understand you were backstage with Alan Coolio at the American Music Awards. No, I was not. I was invited by Al, and I said no. I don't like. I don't like getting in limelight at all ever. And the whole thing for Bad Hair Day. It was a crazy, crazy ride because I did not know how I was going to pull it off. I used a, another hair person to come on with me just for support and confidence. But I had already, you know, went through the motions in my head of how I was going to achieve the look for the album cover with the Coolio uh, braided dreads. And the only way it could happen was to wire it. Right. And so it was a rigging system that I worked. And, you know, God bless him and thank God Al is not super sensitive on his scalp. <laughs> um, yeah. You know, and it was putting in the, uh, the added extension, braid extension, and, you know, incorporating it right into his zone and weaving it in. And it worked. And it was great. So Bad Hair Day on the album place first, and and then uh, Pinky uh, Cunningham, who was doing uh, the hair with me, she helped to get the other bandmates uh, done. Okay. And, you know, you know, to get the hair to stand straight up, I had to put a, a metal grate behind it that was like a, a matching of wire that was stiff enough. And, and thin enough so I could anchor it onto the head and then put the hair up in front of it so the hair could stand up. There's a hair product that you can use to do that. And I used that to spray the hair to keep it, but I knew that the band was going to be in the, these hairstyles for more than, you know, a few minutes to take the shot and get it done. It, you know, they were going to sit around for a while. So I understand the nature of all of that and and to make it happen. And then when Al 
I always ask to do the, um, the American Music Awards, and he knew that he was presenting with Coolio. We had no idea how Coolio was going to look presenting. I just went with my gut and did the same thing that I did for the Bad Hair Day album cover. Yep. And so when Al, and he, Al asked me if I wanted to go, and I was like, yeah, no. Um, you're going to be fine. <laughs> Nothing's going to happen. If I have to undo and take your hair down afterwards, then the, then we'll do that. But, um, yeah, he went and, and Coolio thought it was cool. He checked his eyes with man who did your hair. Um, <laughs> and, and it, it was in a very similar style of the dreads that Coolio was wearing and, and a bit exaggerated, which made it brilliant. Yeah. And Julio was teaching Al, this is what I've learned from Al, that Julio was teaching him how to do the Julio walk. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, well, I, I call it <laughs> walk, which is what they, I grew up in Detroit. So that's where the pimp slide comes in. You the hand going down and back and like, I'm cool. So he, he teaches him how to do the Julio walk and they go out to present together and they got a standing ovation, you know, because it was hysterical. Yeah. And it was it was great. You know, and unfortunately it all went sideways after the fact, but which was really important unfortunate and should never have happened, but it did. And yeah. I felt bad for Al because Al doesn't have like I said, he doesn't come from that place. It's it's just not humanly possible for him. Right. And how many times would you estimate that you had to put Al into those Coolio braids? There's at least two times you mentioned. Were there other times that you had to put Al in the braids? Three? Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, I did it for the album cover. I did it for the American Music Awards. And then there's a scene that we did... And I, I believe my memory, that's gone back so many years. I think there was also a part of the day in Amish Paradise. Yeah, yeah. Where he, right. Yeah, yeah. So it was three times. That's enough. <laughs> it took, I got, the first time, the rigging took me three hours. Wow. And then I was able to get it down to about two and a half hours. Um, but yeah, it was, you know, it, it worked great, but it, there was a lot of wiring and rigging, rigging on the base of the scalp, covered up by Yeah, I imagine. Wow. Putting wire in and twisting it and, you know, and then bending it and shaping it to like the dry. It just, <laughs> it worked. <laughs> but it was, it was not a pain-free process for him. Oh, I can imagine. Hmm. Wow. You know, it's very tight because it required me to have that hair tight and wrapped on the wire in order for it to work. If it was loose, it never would have happened. Right. Well, I'm curious. So, you know, obviously that's like one of the more complicated hairstyles Al has ever had. Was it super easy in comparison to do um, the bald cap for Gump or is, is that challenging because of how much hair Al has? We need to stop the interview right there, but we will be back next episode with even more with makeup and hair designer Roseanne McElvain. We'd love to thank John Vermeer Schwartz for sharing some photos from his archive with us of Roseanne. Be sure to head to our Facebook group, group.2000inch.com, to see the photos this week and next episode. <laughs> Ooh, that noise means that we have a call on the 347 Spatula Hotline, the official hotline of Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al podcast. Let's take a listen, assuming our stupid intern Frank still knows how to push play. Hey guys, this is Matt from Cleveland. I heard you were wondering about Vanna White, and I actually contacted her about four and a half years ago and asked her if she had ever heard the song Stuck in the Closet with Vanna White. Her reply was simple and straight to the point. I like it, with an exclamation point. So there you go, the answer to an age-old question. Does Vanna like the song about her? So now that we have the answer, 
I was wondering, y'all got Hambu? Thank you for the call, Matt. Dave, I remember many episodes ago we were discussing whether or not Vanna White had ever publicly spoken about the song Stuck in a Closet with Vanna White. So it sounds like Matt has finally gotten us the answer. Yeah, thank you, Matt, for getting to the bottom of that age-old question. This week's episode is brought to you in part by Discover Darwin, promoting tourism in Darwin, Minnesota. Not only is historic Darwin, Minnesota uh, beautiful, it's also recreational. Darwin, Minnesota is still home to Darwin Dassel Park. Darwin Dassel Park is still the largest park in Meeker County. The park still contains six and a half miles of trails for hiking, cross-country skiing, and horseback riding. Does it still not say anything about skiing horses? It still does not, but the park still also has a sliding hill, which provides a beautiful lookout over the area and restrooms. And you know, Dave, if there's anything that we look for in a park, it's still a beautiful view of the restrooms. So visit Darwin, Minnesota on your next expedition. Discover Darwin more than just a twine ball. And after you visit Darwin, Minnesota, be sure to visit discoverdarwin.biz. Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast is brought to you absolutely free thanks to our incredible sponsors, Burrito Burrito, Discover Darwin, and Jackson Scoggins. Our podcast is also supported by everyone in our Patreon family, with special thanks to our amazing close personal friend level Patreon supporters, Kenneth, Scott, Zeb, Adriana, Allison, Blair, Frank from the Bank, Jake, Jared, Javier, and UH Jeff. Also, thanks to Joe and everyone else in our pretty stinking majestic Patreon family. If you enjoy our family-friendly weekly Weird Al podcast, please consider supporting us at patreon.com slash 2000inch. There are awesome benefits like getting your name on the podcast and access to secret episodes. Plus, you can learn how to become a sponsor of our podcast. And don't forget to check out our merchandise shop over at shop.2000inch.com. Our new line of We Hate Intern Frank merchandise makes a great gift for Valentine's Day. We love hearing from our listeners and other Weird Al fans. Join our Facebook community and post about Weird Al by visiting group.2000inch.com. And we also love it when we receive voicemail via our official 27-hour-a-day podcast hotline, 347 Spatula. You might even hear your message on a future episode. For everything about our podcast, including incredible past episodes and guests, be sure to visit weirdalpodcast.com or 2000inch.com. And while you're there, click on Black and White and Weird All Over bonus episodes for our special bonus episode book series where author John Bermuda Schwartz walks us through his book page by page and picture by picture. Keep up on new episodes, podcast news, and events by following at 2000inch on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. And thank you for subscribing and leaving reviews on your favorite podcast app. Make sure you're subscribed, because not only does it help the podcast, it also strengthens your uvula. Thank you once again to this episode's guest, Roseanne McElvain, and also thank you to John Bermuda Schwartz and Matt Horn. Thank you to the Grammy Award winning Jim Kimo West for our incredible podcast theme song, and thank you to Weird Al Yankovic, as this podcast probably would not exist without him. And a big thank you to all of you, our listeners, subscribers, Patreon supporters and sponsors, and everyone else who makes our podcast possible. Thank you for choosing Dave and Ethan's 2000-inch Weird Al podcast. Be sure to join us next episode for the exciting conclusion to our interview with Roseanne McElvain. Until next time, remember to gill and chill. That was Dave and Ethan's 2000 Inch Weird Al Podcast, episode 145 Inch. Check it out! We're trending in the Czech Republic! I took pictures of all the girls and I snuck it in the desk drawer. <laughs>